Welcome back. As we saw last lecture, domes overcame some of the inherent limitations of the arch. But as we saw in our earlier exploration of arch structures from the Roman era through the Middle Ages, arches also got better over time. Today we'll open a new chapter in the story of arch structures, starting at the dawn of the Industrial Revolution and continuing through the present day. During this period, the development of the arch was most apparent in bridges. In exploring the modern development of the arch bridge, we'll see the influence of a fundamentally new structural material, iron. And we'll examine the profound influence of science-based design methods which accompanied the introduction of iron in structures. Now you may be wondering how I could possibly refer to iron as a fundamentally new structural material when it's actually been around and in use for thousands of years. Well, prior to the Industrial Revolution, iron was in use, but it was quite expensive, and it couldn't be produced in sufficient quantities to make structural elements economically. A major limitation was the use of charcoal as the sole source of heat for iron furnaces and forges. Charcoal was made from wood, and the resulting demand was so great that it led to widespread deforestation, leading to shortages of timber for shipbuilding, fuel, and other purposes. But everything changed early in the 18th century when a British iron maker named Abraham Darby developed a process to use coke made from coal as the fuel source for smelting iron. Coal was plentiful in Britain, and so Darby's process contributed mightily to the start of the Industrial Revolution in that country. Darby started a smelting business in the aptly named town of Colebrookdale in 1709 and quickly proved that coke-fired furnaces could produce larger batches of iron with consistently higher quality. Iron making then contributed to the economic development in the region and by 1775, it was clear that a new bridge over the Severn River at Colebrookdale would be needed. Various proposals were considered, and in 1777, the contract to build the bridge was awarded to Abraham Darby III. Now, given that he was the grandson of the great ironmaster and would be building at the very birthplace of the iron industry, it was perhaps inevitable that Darby's bridge would be made of iron. And... Here's the result, the world's first iron bridge, known simply as the Iron Bridge at Colebrookdale. Completed in 1779, the structure is made entirely of cast iron, except of course for those stone foundations that you can see in this photo. The main arch spans 100 feet and it's 40 feet high. It uses five parallel sets of arch ribs, each with a solid rectangular cross-section of iron measuring nine inches by seven inches. Each rib was actually cast in two 70 foot long pieces using the traditional sand casting process. Now, the way this process worked was that a rectangular channel like this was carved into a bed of sand on the floor of Darby's foundry. And then molten iron was poured into the channel and allowed to harden to form the arch rib. Once the iron components of the bridge were prefabricated, the structure was then assembled on a traditional temporary centering, and it was done in just three months, a dramatic demonstration of an important advantage of iron construction, rapid constructability. A stone bridge would have taken far longer to build. This schematic illustrates the major structural components of the iron bridge. The most important of these components are, of course, the three sets of parallel semicircular arch rings. The innermost ring spans from support to support, and it's connected directly to the iron deck at midspan. The other two run from the supports up to the deck, but not completely across the span. So how does the structural system work? Well, quite well, actually. The main external loads, people and vehicles, are applied to the deck, and then they're transmitted downward through two different load paths. Near the ends of the span, they're transmitted through these vertical posts, 
in compression straight downward to the structural foundations. Those intersecting horizontal members are actually lateral braces, which strengthen the posts against buckling. Near the center of the span, loads are transmitted directly into the arch rings where the deck and the arches are connected. Note that all of the main load carrying elements in this bridge are in fact in compression. So Darby's use of cast iron, strong in compression, weak in tension, was entirely appropriate. Notice these radial links. They hold the three arch rings in alignment and they also brace them against buckling. Note also that they look amazingly similar to the voussoir joints in a traditional stone arch. More about that in a moment. And what about these unusual structural elements? Well, they serve the same function as spandrels in a masonry arch, filling the space between the deck and the arch rings. But load transmission from the deck down to the arch could have been accomplished far more easily and more effectively with a simple vertical strut. Why are these elements circular? Well, it turns out that during this era, many British masonry arch bridges were actually built with holes in the spandrels to reduce weight. Here's an example, the Puntyprith Bridge in Wales. So the circular iron spandrels in the Colebrookdale Bridge are an example of that same phenomenon that we saw in ancient Greek temple architecture, the decorative stone triglyphs that represent the timber beams used in earlier wooden temples. The circular members at Colebrookdale are actually artifacts carried over from an earlier structural form, even though they don't really make structural sense when they're implemented in iron. Another fascinating aspect of the iron bridge is that all of its connections use traditional timber joinery methods, dovetail joints, as you see here, connecting those radial links to the arch rings, and mortise and tenon joints, here where those verticals and horizontal members intersect out at the ends of the span. These connections work reasonably well, but they were certainly much harder to fabricate in iron than bolted and riveted joints would have been. Still, prior to 1779, no one had ever even considered making structural connections in iron, so it was entirely reasonable for Darby to use these familiar timber joinery methods. It's very interesting to compare the iron bridge at Colebrookdale with Pont St. Martin that Roman bridge of the first century BC. Notice that their overall size and form are nearly identical, even to that slight upward peak of the deck, which was actually required because the semicircular arch is a bit higher than the riverbanks in both cases. More importantly, their structural systems work exactly the same way. It's very clear that Abraham Darby designed his iron structure to mimic a masonry one to the greatest extent possible. The Iron Bridge at Colebrookdale was a milestone in the history of structural engineering. In effect, it marked the beginning of the end of stone and timber as the dominant materials for bridges and buildings. Yet, despite its innovative use of a new material, the Iron Bridge is actually relatively crude in a structural engineering sense. Darby had the foresight to see the potential of iron, but he couldn't see that a fundamentally new material would also call for fundamentally new structural concepts. And so he replicated the old paradigms for stone arches and wood joinery in iron. But that's exactly what we'd expect in an empirically designed structure. Empirical design is fundamentally incremental and it's grounded in the past. Most innovations are relatively modest adaptations of prior experience. At Colebrookdale, Iron represented an unprecedented source of uncertainty to Abraham Darby. It's entirely reasonable for Darby to have minimized uncertainty in all other aspects of the design by looking backward to well-established technologies wherever he could. The most important characteristic of science-based engineering is its ability to predict the future. This stimulates innovation because the designer can predict the structural response for many different structural concepts without having to actually build any of them. Now in a moment we'll be looking at another innovative metal arch, the Eads Bridge over the Mississippi River at St. Louis. By 1867, when this bridge was designed, 
Comprehensive methods for science-based engineering were already well established and in widespread use. But first, how did we get from Colebrookdale to St. Louis? Let's recap some of the key scientific discoveries underlying that transition from empirical engineering at Colebrookdale to science-based engineering in the later bridges. 92 years before Abraham Darby built his bridge, Isaac Newton published his Laws of Motion. Yet these powerful ideas had absolutely no influence on the Iron Bridge. And even as Darby's arches were being set on the foundations at Colebrookdale, many foundational theories of engineering mechanics were being formulated in other parts of the world. In the late 1700s, Leonhard Euler was developing his theory of column buckling, and a French military engineer named Charles Coulomb was advancing the mechanics of flexure, though Coulomb would earn far greater fame through his work in electricity and magnetism. In the early 1800s, Claude Navier, who we've already met, built upon Coulomb's work to establish a fully coherent mathematical model of flexure. And in 1847, Squire Whipple published his scientific theory of truss analysis that today we call the method of joints. Now, it's very easy to look back on these developments and assume that science-based engineering simply followed naturally from these scientific discoveries. In fact, nothing could be farther from the truth. For a period of over 150 years, well-grounded theoretical methods of structural analysis were readily available in the scientific literature, but they went entirely unused by practicing engineers, and there are two fundamental reasons why. First, the old empirical design rules were very well established, and it must be said that within engineering practice, they were generally effective. Structures designed using these tried and true rules were safe and functional. Among engineering practitioners, there was little reason to believe that science-based methods would significantly improve the standard masonry and wood structures that were being built in that day. And second, many of these new theoretical models had been created by mathematicians and scientists with no real grounding in the practical realities of construction. Thus, they weren't trusted by builders who saw the theories as too simplistic to represent real materials and real structures. Two decisive events spurred the transition from empirical to science-based design. The first was the advent of mass-produced iron, and the second was Abraham Darby's demonstration that an entire structural system could in fact be built from this material. Iron was the world's first new structural material since Roman concrete. There were no precedents and no standard empirical rules for its use. And since iron structural members were cast in a mold rather than carved from a stone block or a tree trunk, significant cost savings could be gained from minimizing the amount of material that was used in each member. And so iron provided a clear economic incentive to use those scientific theories as the basis for design. They were actually the only feasible method for achieving structural lightness in iron. And this concept of achieving cost effectiveness by minimizing weight lies at the very heart of modern structural engineering. But it only really made sense with the advent of structural iron. And that brings us to the Eads Bridge of 1867. Its designer, James Eads, was a brilliant, self-taught engineer who made his fortune in the mid-1800s by salvaging sunken ships from the bed of the Mississippi River. During the American Civil War, he built ironclad warships for the Union Navy. And after the war, he became involved in the effort to build a bridge across the Mississippi at St. Louis. Though he had initially opposed the bridge as a potential impediment to navigation on the river, he eventually recognized that it was essential for the city's economic vitality. His reputation as an engineer was so great that he was ultimately awarded the contract to design and build it, even though he had never designed a bridge before. Eads was a self-taught engineer, but he was quite well grounded in structural mechanics. In a remarkable 1868 report to the directors of the Illinois and St. Louis Bridge Company, and those were his bosses on the project, 
Eads explained his rationale for using steel arches rather than traditional iron trusses as the principal structural elements in his design. His explanation reflects a clear understanding of equilibrium, mechanics of materials, and structural design principles, those same principles we've been learning throughout this course. Nonetheless, despite his strong grounding in mechanics, Eads went a step farther. He hired two German board engineers with strong scientific credentials to run his design shop. And so we can conclude that the Eads Bridge was undeniably a product of science-based engineering. When it was completed, James Eads' masterpiece was the longest arch bridge in the world and the first to use steel as its primary structural material. In comparison with that iron bridge at Colebrookdale, the Eads Bridge is a far more structurally coherent design. The main arch ribs are hollow tubes rather than solid bars because tubes, as we know, are more resistant to buckling. Rather than connecting the arch ribs together with simple links, as at Colebrookdale, Eads achieved far greater rigidity by connecting them together with trusses, as you can see here. And the spandrels of the Eads Bridge are composed of simple vertical columns, which efficiently transmit load from the deck downward into the arches. Because Eads was prohibited from blocking river traffic during construction, he couldn't use temporary centering as Darby had at Colebrookdale. Instead, he devised this system for suspending the partially completed arches from temporary towers at the ends of each span. He called this system the canted lever method because the partially completed arch worked like a lever that was tilted upward from its base. This is the origin of the term cantilever, which we discussed in our lecture on beams. Thanks to James Eads, this term became part of the engineering lexicon and was eventually applied to a new form of long span truss bridge, which we'll study in a future lecture. Of course, the most important difference between the two bridges is size, with each span of the Eads Bridge measuring five times longer than the single span at Colebrookdale, and 20% longer than the next largest arch then in existence. The Eads Bridge is a vivid illustration of the power of science-based engineering design. It was a substantial extrapolation from previous bridges, not just in its use of a new material, but also in its size and method of construction. These kinds of extrapolations were only possible because Eads had science-based methods. He had the analytical tools to predict how each of those uh, new initiatives would work. Today, the Eads Bridge is still in use, carrying highway traffic and light rail across the Mississippi and beautifully complementing the Gateway Arch nearby. And the cantilever construction method that he devised is also still in use. Here's the spectacular new Hoover Dam bypass bridge when it was under construction in 2009, with its unfinished arch suspended from the ends of the span exactly as James Eads devised the method nearly 150 years ago. Okay, now let's journey from St. Louis to South Central France. During the same general period of time, the French government was expanding its railroad network in the largely undeveloped Massif Central region of the country, an area known for its steep gorges and very high winds. Recognizing the inherent challenges of this project, they hired one of France's most capable engineers to design and build the bridges for these new railroad lines. His name was Gustave Eiffel. Starting in 1864, Eiffel designed and built seven major railroad bridges. The last and most magnificent of these was the Garabit Viaduct, completed in 1884. Eiffel personally recommended this site for this viaduct because it would reduce the cost of the planned railroad line by shortening the route and by eliminating several other bridges. But in doing so, he left himself with an extremely challenging site due to the deep ravine that had to be spanned. The resulting structure met this challenge with a 530-foot arch, that's 10 feet longer than the Eads Bridge's longest span, and at 400 feet high, it was the tallest arch in the world. The structural system of the Garabit Viaduct is fairly easy to discern from this photo. The railroad line is supported on a horizontal deck truss, which is supported on stone abutments out at its ends, 
on a series of trussed towers in between, and then directly on the center of the arch in the middle. What makes this structure so special is the arch itself. Viewed from the side, its overall shape is parabolic, the optimum profile for a uniformly loaded arch. Eiffel configured the arch as a truss because the wind loads on that open framework would be less than on a solid girder. The top and bottom cords of the truss are arranged in a crescent shape, widest at the middle and then tapering all the way down to a point at the ends where the arch is supported on two massive pins. The result is a structure that's optimally proportioned to carry both uniform loading, its self-weight, and the large concentrated loads that would be caused by heavy locomotives crossing the span. Concentrated loads cause bending in an arch. And back in lecture six, we saw several examples of modern beams that vary in depth according to the internal moment that they're required to carry. Eiffel's crescent arch works exactly the same way. It's deepest in the center where the internal moments are likely to be highest. And then it tapers all the way down to a point at the pinned supports where the internal moment is guaranteed to be zero. It is a truly elegant design from a structural engineering perspective. Viewed from the end of the span, the arch is substantially wider at its base than up at its peak where it connects to the deck truss. As we've seen, a wider base has greater stability against overturning. And so this configuration is optimal for resisting wind loads, an important consideration for such a tall structure in a region of persistent strong winds. As we examine Eiffel's crescent-shaped arch, we can only marvel at how far we've come from Colebrookdale. In the Iron Bridge, Darby mimicked a masonry arch, and he borrowed connection details from traditional timber construction. At Garabit, Eiffel borrowed nothing. There is nothing about his crescent arch that evokes any earlier tradition. It's a totally original solution to a unique structural challenge. Viewed in the context of traditional arch bridges, Eiffel's crescent has everything backwards. It's thin where it should be thick, it's tapered where it should be straight, it's open where it should be solid. But viewed in terms of the underlying science, it's hard to imagine a more perfectly configured structure. In the Garabit Viaduct, we see science taking engineering in a whole new direction. Five years after completing this great structure, Gustav Eiffel would design and build his famous 1,000-foot tower in Paris, which was so successful that it ended up overshadowing all of his other great engineering accomplishments. Today, few people know about his innovative railroad viaducts of the Massif Central, but we who do know can see reflections of these great bridges in his Paris tower, in the intricacy of the trusses and the optimal tailoring of structural form to resist wind loads. Today, even fewer people know about Eiffel's other great achievement, this one in America. The design of the Statue of Liberty's internal support structure, a project he completed just one year after Garabit. Here again, we see Eiffel and science-based engineering at their very best, producing an original and enduring solution to a very unique structural challenge of supporting this irregularly shaped statue from within. In the hundred years from Colebrookdale to Garabit, iron and steel arches came a very long way. What's happened in the 120 years since? This is the Campo Volantin Bridge in Bilbao, Spain, designed by Santiago Calatrava and built in 1997. It's a structural configuration that we haven't seen before, a tied arch. Where conventional arches use heavy foundations to resist lateral thrust, this configuration uses a tension tie that connects the two ends of the span together. The effect is very similar to a bow held in its correct shape by its bowstring. Here, from underneath the bridge, you can clearly see that tension tie that holds the two ends of the arch together. The tied arch configuration opens up all sorts of new possibilities for siding a structure because the structural foundations are no longer required to carry that huge lateral thrust that would be associated with a conventional arch. Note, 
that the Campo Volantin Bridge is perched on top of two cantilever access ramps, which are far less substantial than the massive foundations that would be necessary if this were a conventional arch. The laterally curved deck of this bridge is suspended from the main arch by an array of fine steel cables, tension members, just like the suspenders of a suspension bridge. The single graceful arch is a hollow steel tube, parabolic in profile, just like Eiffel's great arch at Garabit. But unlike Garabit, or any previous arch for that matter, this entire arch is tilted sideways. The visual effect is stunning, yet somehow that leaning arch also seems perfectly natural. Why? Well, I think the reason is that the arch leans in the opposite direction of the deck's lateral curve. So the arch and the deck counterbalance each other. The leaning arch looks natural for the same reason that two teams in a tug of war look perfectly natural when they're leaning away from each other. At the end of the day, it's all about equilibrium. The Campo Volantin Bridge represents yet another step forward in science-based engineering. Because of its complex three-dimensional geometry, its internal forces could only possibly be analyzed with the aid of computer-based structural analysis tools. And so today, the computer has opened many new avenues for structural innovation. Yet I absolutely have to emphasize that these computer-based tools are based on all of those same principles of engineering mechanics that we've been learning about throughout this course. Computers allow us to solve problems of incredible complexity, but not because they use any new theory. Rather, just because they can solve mathematical equations so much faster than we humans can. All of the underlying science is the same. And as I've tried to demonstrate in the leaning arch on the Campo Volantin Bridge, complex geometry doesn't prevent us from understanding qualitatively how a structure works. At first glance, this bridge seems like a very weird structure, but it's one we can understand quite well by applying what we know about basic structural mechanics in the parabolic shape of the arch, which as we know is optimal for arch structures, in the tied arch configuration, which makes perfect sense as an alternative to the traditional arch, and in the counterbalancing of that curved deck and the leaning arch. At the end of the day, it's all about equilibrium. During this lecture, we've examined the development of arch bridges from the late 18th century through the present day. We've seen how iron spurred the application of science-based engineering, and in turn, how science-based design has stimulated innovation and fostered structures of, of unprecedented scale and sophistication. In the next two lectures, we'll retrace our steps back through this same historical period, but we'll focus on the development of a very different kind of structure, one that is, in fact, the exact opposite of an arch, the suspension bridge. And just as the development of the arch was profoundly influenced by the need to restrain that outward lateral thrust of an arch in compression, so we'll see that the development of the suspension bridge was similarly influenced by the need to support the tremendous inward pull of the cable in tension. Until then, thank you.